We had a great Thanksgiving, and I trust you did too. And one of the annual things I do at Thanksgiving is watch ball games. And uh, all, th all teams that I was really for lost. All three of them in one day. I thought by Friday night I'd need a shrink. But it came to my viewpoint, they're only a game and it really doesn't matter after all. Point, point of enjoyment and it should not spoil my day or my night and so forth. So I got over it and I'm ready to go. Didn't take about, about 10 minutes. This morning I want to talk about a vital church in a community that is churched. What is our role as a Bible teaching church in a community where we have a church almost on every corner? We're not in an area where people have never heard of a church. We're not in an area where people have never heard of God or worship some stone, God of stone, or something of that nature. So what are we, why do we exist as a church? Why a church here on this particular intersection? And Paul sums that up in Titus in verses 3 to 8. He's been talking to the people of the island and, Ty and Crete, and he's been saying, you have a ministry among yourselves in chapter 3, to the older men, the older women, younger women, younger men. And he tells us, well, we are to act one with another. Then he tells us how we are to act toward the people outside the church <laughs> and why we are supposed to act that way. And he tells us that we were once lost, we were once disobedient, we were once anti-God, even though we may have been religious, and it wasn't until we came to grips with the fact that Jesus Christ died for us, and we repented of our sin and placed our faith in him. And so he says in verse 8 of chapter 3 of Titus, this is a trustworthy statement. Literally, that would read, this is a faithful word. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently, speaking to me and the elders of the church and the leaders, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. When we talk about a local church like ours or any Bible-believing church, the church is made up of all kinds of individuals from all kinds of different backgrounds. And we all have different gifts, and we all have different personalities. And all of us who are born again at least have one spiritual gift. When you became a Christian, at that particular point, God gave you a gift. Not a gift to hide under a bushel basket. Not a gift to keep in the dark. But a gift to exercise and use within the body of Christ for others. We have men in the church who have the gift of leadership, ladies who have the gift of leadership. We have those in the church that have the gift of exhortation. They're encouraging. When you go to them, you always feel encouraged. We have people in the church that have the gift of helps. No matter what happens, they seem to be able to do the right thing, say the right thing, and do the right thing. We have people in the church that have the gift of administration. No matter how chaotic something may be, they have the ability to step in and organize it and get it going. We have some who have the gift of teaching, and we have some who have the gifts of mercy. Now, I've often would, was tempted to do this. I've never done it. I probably do it in a Bible study, that every gift probably has its little bit of weakness. Those of us who have the gift of leadership may tend to run over some people. And then we have people who have the gift of mercy come along and build them up. And we who have the gift of, of mercy don't always see things as clearly as those who have the gift of discernment, who can say, this is wrong. This is going in the wrong direction. 
and the person is merciful would tend to maybe glide over it. So I think there's a strength in every gift, a weakness in every gift, but all the gifts together make up the body of Christ. And we have them here at Countryside. And God expects us, by the Holy Spirit, to use all these gifts and exercise and use them for his honor and for his glory. So this is the church collective. That's why there's no such thing literally as a home church where the father is a pastor, deacon, and takes the offering. There's no such thing because there's no other gifts that complement, basically, complement the people within the body. We need them all. We need people who have the teaching ability, who have the ability to teach children. Not every teacher has that ability. And we need people in the church that have all of these kinds of things. And your family and my family need the whole church to work together and others to come in and supplement what gifts I lack as a father or a parent and help our children out. And all of us men and all of us ladies in the church who are born again need one another to make that blend. So Paul is saying today, this is a trustworthy statement, and concerning those things I want to speak to you. So how do we now, as a Bible teaching church, how do we have an effective ministry in an area where there's a church on every corner? I live in a town of 430 people, two churches in town. That's a lot of, that, that, you know, you could have 200 in each church and cover the whole town. And that's not what would be considered a large, a large church, would it? And I can think of towns around that have three churches. I can think of towns around that aren't very large at all, have more than that. So what is our role in all this? And are we just spending the Lord's money thin by operating like we are operating? So he says, this is a trustworthy statement in light of what I've been saying. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. Paul says, I don't want you to be vacillating on this. I don't want you to beat around the bush. I don't want you to say things that people walk out and say, what in the world did he say? I mean, I grew up in a church, and I, we live 15 miles from town, and my folks would discuss the sermon, and I'd hear them say, what in the world what did he mean? And even at that young age, I always felt like, if you don't know what he means, why are we going there? Go someplace where we can figure out what he says. Finally got to Bible college, and one of the professors says, this is the word of God, and this is what it means, and this is truth. Well, now I felt like I'd been a cold shower. It hurt, but it really felt good afterwards. Paul says, speak these things confidently. Don't do this. So those who have believed, that's a church, will be careful to engage in good deeds. And here's where I want to spend our time. A church like us is to be faithful in good deeds. Let me give you an example. Like I told you at the beginning, I was enjoying a ball game. I get a call, middle of the ball game. And my spiritual response is, oh, shucks. So I take the phone. Somebody has stopped at the church and is out of gas. Now, folks, uh, you might be surprised how many people actually stop here during the week, change tires, change diapers, walk the dog, do all kinds of things, fix the car. You'd be surprised. We're right here on a corner, and God put us here. Now, I have mercy, but I don't have the gift of mercy. <laughs> but there are those who do in this church, for which I'm very thankful. So the guys run out of gas. But God has, in his providence, made our TV that I can hold it. I can come back and pick it up. So it's not quite as bad as it seems. So I come down to the church. He says he has a quarter tank left, and uh, he could make it to a gas station. So I tell him, come on up to Hampton. We'll fill you up. 
And I'm going over there, not in the best of moods. And I drive up, and he's driving almost a brand new Lexus. That caused me, my mood to go, whew. What little mercy I had went. And I said, uh, he could tell, I guess, I wasn't in the best of moods. I said, pull her up, we'll fill her up with ethanol. I, and he began to talk to me. His brother's dying. He's leaving Omaha. He just left Omaha. He comes to the church here. He's going to Utah. And he wants to know where the next church is that he could get some more gas. So I gave him my friend's church in North Platte. And I, as I'm speaking, I, I began to realize this guy needs the Lord more than he needs gas, really. And uh, my mood began to change. And before I got home, I said to the Lord, I had a rotten attitude. That is not in, is not in light of the sermon I'm going to be preaching Sunday. So I confess my sin. And you know what I found out? He's faithful. He's, he'll do that. God will do the same thing every time. <coughs> he will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But you'd be surprised, folks, how, like I said, how many people stop here. And I think within the last couple of weeks, we've had more calls than we've had in the the previous 10 months. And I think it's going to get worse. <clears throat> I think that we're facing an economic crisis. It's just, maybe it won't last very long. Maybe it will never get out of it. I don't know. But there's one thing that we as a church can do, and that is be faithful in good deeds. And we'll talk about them. But I want <clears throat> to talk to you this morning about the motivation for good deeds. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It's not on your notes, it's not on the board. But it's a very familiar verse. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. We read this. But now, faith Hope, love, abide. These three. What's the next line say? The greatest of these is what? Love. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5.14. That'll be on the board. Do you know that there are 55 direct commands in the New Testament to love, 55 of them. When we read about our salvation in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, we read this. For the love of Christ constrains us or controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he who died for all, so that they who live might no longer Live for themselves, key word. But for him, Christ, who died and rose again on their behalf. We're to live for Christ. And living for Christ is, is exercising his love toward others. In Galatians 2.20, we read this. For we have been crucified with Christ... And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is our purpose? It to see how much money we can ma make, how many bins we can have, 
What is our purpose as a Christian? As one missionary said years ago, I just make a living to pay the expenses. Actually, I'm living really for Christ. That is the issue, is it not? Now, when we talk about why a church is here, we understand that the church is here to do two main things, two main purposes. One, to reach the community in which we live, and the second, to build each other up in the faith by teaching. When we, uh, when we look at evangelism in the area, when we look at it from a biblical point of view, I'd like to give you about seven points of view here that are not on a board. But first of all, in evangelism, we are responsible for our own community. That's where it starts. We are to exercise and send out missionaries to the hither lands, but you and I are responsible for the community we live and we are responsible that everybody in our community has heard a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This needs to be hammered home in our Sunday school, in our Awana, in our adult Bible studies. We're here to evangelize and we're here to win the children we have here to Jesus Christ. Maybe they'll be one to the Lord at their mother or father's knee. Or at a WANA leader, at a Sunday school teacher, a youth director, wherever. But the gospel must be foremost in all that we do here. So that when a person walks out of here on Sunday morning and somebody calls them and says, I'm dying, how can I get to heaven? You can go right over there and you can clearly tell them how to get to heaven. And you don't have to call your youth leader. You don't have to call a Sunday school teacher. You don't have to call a pastor. You have that right and know that. Can you do it? Can you honestly sit down and say, here's how you can get to heaven? If you were asked. We're responsible for our own community. For the neighbors and people that make up the people around us in sharing the gospel. Secondly, in evangelism, corporate worship, corporate church is absolutely, pre, pre, absolutely important for personal evangelism. The stronger your local church is, in evangelization and preaching the gospel, the easier it is for you to evangelize your neighbors. Now, people don't come to Christ in the church. It's out there where they come to Christ. It's not that they don't come to Christ here. But where do the Sheep are to be born. They're to be born again out in the communities in which we live, where we work, where we move, where we have our being. But a strong church is imperative. You come here and you're encouraged, you're strengthened, you fellowship with the believers and you go out armed. And after you've witnessed a few times, you're glad to come back and be strengthened and reaffirmed in your faith. Thirdly, evangelism takes place in the world, not, not in the church. I mean, you can go to some churches and they'll have evangelistic meetings every Sunday. You hear the gospel every Sunday, you'll have an altar call every Sunday. You hear it every Sunday. And people have the idea that the evangelism takes place in the church when the actuality should take place in the communities where we live. And when they come to know the Lord, the first thing we do is we bring them to the church to be edified. And you know that they will be edified. Furthermore, we target whole houses. 
Sometimes churches have found it easier to go after the children rather than the parents. And we rear children up in a church where the parents don't come. And what happens when they're teenagers, a large part, is they disappear. We need to target whole households. And we need to pray for whole households and pray for the mom and dad that God, the Holy Spirit, will take the word and use it and bring them to faith. <clears throat> Furthermore, we need to identify the leaders in the church and we have a need to identify those who are willing to go out in the mission field. We need to find out who in Countryside Bible Church, who are the future leaders here? Who are the ones that will, be, will take the gospel to the mission field or take the gospel and get themselves training and become pastoral ministers? Now, we're bringing in a young man. This will, this will be basically his first ministry, Aaron, and uh, we have a responsibility to him. We have a responsibility to encourage him, and we have a responsibility. He may not be here all his life. He may be. I don't know. But like Abe, if he leaves, he should be quipped to do God's work, and we've given him the experience and we've given him the encouragement to really go out and minister the Word of God. And if God should lead some young man and some woman in this congregation to feel led to go to the mission field or feel led to go into the pastorate, we as a church should be right there to encourage them. And we spread our ministry that way. So we need to identify them. Furthermore, we need to develop ways to reach our community. Figure out ways to reach our community. I think we did last Sunday night with our, with our banquet. We had people that came in from our community that normally don't come to this church. That's great. We have a Bible study where some people come to our Bible study that don't normally come to our church. That's a great way to do it. And to use our homes. When's the last time you had a neighbor over or a stranger over? You know, our tendency is to invite people we know and we love and we have fellowship immediately. Right? When's the last time you decide, let's just invite Joe Noakes over? He's lived across the street, across the section. Or I've met him in a coffee time in a local little wherever you drink your coffee and say, hey, my wife and I would like to have you and your wife come on over. We'd like to get to know you better. Is that hard? Uh, apparently it is because it doesn't happen too often. And I'm speaking to myself too, guys. But that's why we're in this community. We're to evangelize this community. We're to reach this community for Christ. And we're to edify the saints. So that when people come into our body, <clears throat> when people come into our body, we know and they know we're, they're going to be taught the word. Be in Sunday school, whether they're in a nursery, there's going to be an attitude of love in that nursery all the way up through Sunday school, Awana, Youth group, church, where people come in and they know they're accepted. And I, I'd say we do pretty good on that. We could do better. We could organize it better. But let me tell you something. It's ne never as good as a heartfelt love for the stranger who walks in. And you see, I've never seen this guy in church before. I got to go meet him and thank him for coming here. How many of you have done that? It's nice to get in your little holy huddle and, 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 and meet with your friends. But it's neat to go out and just put yourself out <clears throat> and reach out for others that come in. We have a responsibility to the community. 
You know, when uh, <clears throat> you look at it, evangelism in the New Testament is kind of interesting. When Jesus came, he taught for three and a half years. I think everybody in the country of Israel and surrounding areas heard of Jesus. His miracles, his teaching, and let me tell you something, he caused quite a stir. And as we find out on Wednesday nights, there were a, most of the people hated him. They wanted to kill him. By the third year of his ministry, he hesitated he was, in a good sense, he waited before he went down to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles because they intended to kill him. And the people said, I thought the leaders were to kill him. How's this guy teaching openly in the temple? He saturated the area with the gospel, and he got pro and con response. In fact, we read this in John chapter, take a look and follow with me in your Bibles, to John 20, verses 30 and 31. First of all, he spent three and a half years reaching, preaching the kingdom of God, and then he pulled out of that congregation 12 men with whom he poured into his life for three and a half years, and one even betrayed him. But John 20, verse 30 says, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. So he chose these 12 men. The apostles were involved on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came as promised by Jesus. After the whole event of Pentecost, notice what happened in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 46 to 47. It's not a very long journey from John 20 to Acts chapter 2. Verse 46. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, these people who are saved on Pentecost, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Notice. They were meeting together with gladness, sincerity of heart, praising God, and having favor with all people. And what, we had some people last Sunday night at our banquet who were church people. We're not sure where they stand before the Lord. They don't come here. That doesn't make them saved if they did come here. But we sang some songs, songs they had never really sung before, that had joy. And they loved that. Because you know what they saw in the church? They saw joy and love. I appreciate the church that you can laugh now and then. And I appreciate the church that you have joy. And your heart's full of joy. What, what, what a sad thing to walk into a church that's dead or in a doornail. What a sad thing to walk into a place where they say they love God and they all look like they've just been to the, lost their best friend and they're at their funeral. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is love. What's the next one? Joy. A heart of joy that comes from the peace of God. Flip over to Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 2, and see what happened. The people were all meeting together. They were all in Jerusalem, and they were having a great time. Suddenly, one of the deacons that was chosen, Stephen, is murdered. He dies for his faith. 
And here's what happened. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we read, Saul, who later was Paul, was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. Now, what did Christ say in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? You are my witnesses unto Judea. What's the next one? Samaria. And the other most part of the earth. So, look at Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. They all went wherever they went. They preached the word. They had not been there before. But God used persecution to get them out of their nest, to get them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. The initial journeys of Paul were to evangelize the church. He left Antioch, and he went in through Galatia, went into a missionary, went into areas where they never heard the gospel, ever. He walked into cities, and the only people that even heard about God were Jews, generally meeting in a synagogue. He went in there and started preaching that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the Lord they kicked him out of the seminary or out of the synagogue, probably a seminary too. Some of them aren't all that good. And he started a little group of people and they began to meet and the next thing you know, this is a little church he started. Then he left and went to another city, started the whole thing over. Look at Acts chapter 19, verses 8 to 10. Acts chapter 19, verses 8 to 10. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became hardened, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away took away the disciples reasonably daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. All in Asia? First thing he did, get on the radio. Television. Got on the social media. He did all this without that. We don't need that. It's good we have it. Let's use it. But what about word of mouth? What about our lives? What about our testimony? What about the strength of the local church? Wow, what a, what a testimony this was. The churches in Crete... Well, let's go another one. Acts 14, verse 20, and then we'll talk about the church in Crete. Acts chapter 14, 20 to 23. While we're in the book of Acts, we'll go back a few chapters. After a missionary journey, after they had preached the gospel to that city, notice the order, the gospel, and had made many disciples go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them, to observe all things I had commanded you in this verse. And he made many disciples, and they returned to Lystria and Iconia and Antioch, strengthening the souls of disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Did you hear that? Remember what Jesus said in John 15? If they persecuted me, what are they going to do to you? What are they going to do to us? Well, we could face persecution, couldn't we? Are you ready? If persecution comes to America in order to help evangelize America, would you be for it? 
Would you? We may face it. I don't know. But look what else they did. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they command, commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. You know what Paul did? He evangelized the cities, strengthened the churches, and then appointed godly men to lead the church. Something else. Have you ever noticed when you read Galatians, Romans, Ephesians, the epistles, evangelism is in there, but it's never really straightforward direction, go win the lost. Why? It is because the local church should be so full of a the gospel itself, that they bleed the gospel in their community. I had a friend who came to know Christ. Must have been maybe early 40s. Started coming to church and I said, Eric, you're coming to prayer meeting, you're coming to Sunday night, you're coming to Sunday school, you're coming to everything, and your wife could hardly get you here a few weeks ago. He said, you know, Rod, when you find the Lord, you can't get enough of him. So he, he worked in a, um, like a uh, investment company, you know, where you go get investments. And he worked in a pretty large place. And they had cubicles in his place, and each guy had his own cubicle. And I've told you some of this story before. So Eric walks into his place of business. And Eric says, you know, he went to every cubicle, and here's what he told him. He said, you know, I've just found out, I've just found out, found Christ. I became a born-again believer. And if you do see me doing anything that would bring discredit to Christ, will you tell me? And there's probably anywhere from 15 to 25 guys in this, in this section. He sat down after he'd gone through every cubicle. Sat down, and in walks one of the men. And he said, Eric, you have really shamed me. I've been a Christian since I worked here. And I have told nobody in this place. And you walked in. And did what I should have done. You know, when you start witnessing, and I start witnessing, that puts a shame others who should do it and makes them accountable to do the very same thing. <clears throat> when I candidated in one church, one of the questions was, how many souls have you won to Christ in the last year? I said, I'll answer that question when every one of the elders tells me how many they led to the Lord in the last year. You know what? I didn't have to answer the question. How many have we won? How many have we made an attempt to win? Then it says... Okay, we do the evangelism. Now we do the good, be careful to do, engage in good deeds. What is the one characteristic that makes the Bible teaching church different from the institutionalized churches in our community? The answer is really the good deeds prompted by the Spirit of God. Prayer. Love. Fellowship. But I want to center on love. Take a look at John 13, 34. It's on our, it's on our uh, board. Jesus in the Last Supper says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I've loved you. 
that you also love one another. And then what does he say? What does it say up there? By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Now, clanging cymbals and stuff have their place in a band, but I would not go to a concert where all they did was bang cymbals, would you? Love takes precedence over oratory or pious platitudes. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains, that's quite a bit of faith to move a mountain, and do not have love, Paul says, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, and do not have love, it profits me nothing. Even if I give myself over to be a martyr for Jesus Christ, and don't have love for the people in the church and out of the church, I'm nothing. Doesn't profit me. That hurts. Something that we can't manufacture. It's something the Holy Spirit has to generate within us. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And you can add the rest. But if you don't have love, you don't have any of it because it's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit. They're collective one fruit, like a log chain. If you miss one link in a log chain, what good is it? First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 24 to 25 should be what the church is. And he's talking to a church that's highly gifted and they're speaking in tongues and prophesying and using those things. And we who understand the Christ scripture understand that tongues have ceased to have its importance. It was instrumental in getting the church started. But in this same chapter, chapter 13, verse 8, it says, tongues shall cease. And they cease before actually the end of the age. But in 1 Corinthians 14, 24, But if prophecy, an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account it by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. My prayer would be, and I'm sure yours as well, if an unsaved person walks in here, he senses something. He senses the love. He senses the love for each other, but he senses more the love for God. These people love God. And the secrets of his heart by the Holy Spirit are revealed to him, and he bows down and trusts Christ. And you know who's responsible for that? The whole church. If someone gets saved in our church, be it wherever, WANA, Bible school, Sunday school, adult ministry, or any time a person professes faith in our church or grows in this church, we are all have a part in it. It's not, preacher, how many souls you win? It's preacher, how many church, how in your church? How many people are blessed by the word in the church, collectively? Take a look at 1 Peter chapter 4, 7 to 11. 1 Peter 4, 7 to 11. The end of all things is near, Peter says. 
How long ago is that written? Almost 2,000 years ago. So guess how close we are to the end now. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the per uh, be sober in spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your heart love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. I don't have a brother. I have a sister. I know her faults. She knows mine. But because we love each other, that's not the first thing we tell each other. Others about do we? Because we love them, we don't deal with their faults. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. That's a verse I had to take to heart this week. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whatever, whoever serves is to do so as one serving by the strength which God supplies. So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If you farm, you're farming for God. If you're driving a truck, you're driving a truck for God. If you're an employee, you're doing it for the Lord. If they ask you to sweep in the corners, you sweep in the corners. You're obedient to those who have authority over you. You do what they tell you to do that you may have a testimony to them. I worked for this guy in seminary in a gas station where he still filled cars with gas and for 29 cents. Swept out the car if they wanted it, washed all the windows and checked the oil and water. And then we had a shop to run in the back. And one... And our boss would uh, hire seminary students once in a while to fill in what he did for me. The guy told me, Dave told me, you know, Rod, I don't want to hear your, about any of your witnessing to me or any about your God. They all your seminary students try to save me and it doesn't work. And I said, okay, I won't. Leave you alone. His wife got cancer about a year or two later. I said, Dave, I know you don't want me to talk to you about God, but can I pray for your wife? Oh, please. I know your prayers get through. About three or four years later, I was in Hutchinson, Kansas, ministering the Word of God, and I got a call. This is Dave. We're going to the West Coast. I want to I wanna stop by your house and talk to you. I want to tell you something. You know what he told me? He accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. I didn't have a big oral thing to do with him. Didn't say much about the Lord. But I'd like to think it was my own attitude at work and toward him. You love your job? You should. Who gave it to you? Who gave you your farm? Who gave you the health to run it? Who gave you your husband, your wife, your children? <clears throat> These things are good and profitable for men, says Paul. Here's what he says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. <clears throat> in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For these qualities are yours and are increasing. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Moral excellence ought to be our life. 
knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love are all in these four verses. There it is. You want to take a self-test? How are you doing? May God use Countryside Bible Church to be a lighthouse in this community where people will find the Lord, or the Lord finds them, I should say, I guess, and calls them to be saved, and where the truth is preached and proclaimed without error. Let's stand for closing prayer. Heavenly Father, you put us here for a purpose. We thank you that you led the fathers of the church to plant a church right on this corner. We thank you, Father, for the testimony of this church from people from across the nation drive on I-80. Look over here and see this white building and see the cross and recognize there's a church. And some come here realizing they're safe because it came to a church and not some truck stop. We thank you for that, that we can do good to the community. Help us to be merciful. Help us, Lord, to be helpful. Not only to the strangers driving by, but to the farmers and businessmen and families and young people who drive by this church every day. May as they see that sign, Countryside Bible Church, may the Spirit of God speak to them that here's a place that loves the Lord and loves people. Help us to live up to that billing by the grace of God and the mercy of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who makes up this body. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.